Okay, we're on the record in the state of Florida versus Nicholas Cruz. Uh, I intended that this case be set, the hom what I'll call the homicide case, be set today to discuss uh, future potential dates for pre-jury selection. Uh, then I was asked to add the aggravated battery or attempted aggravated battery case to the docket for housekeeping matters. And then I come here today, and there are very many people sitting in the courtroom. Uh, and I was informed that this may perhaps be some type of a plea. So if, uh, and Mr. Wheeler, it's very nice to see you back. Thank you, Judge. We're happy you're doing well. Um, so you all, let, I'm going to leave it up to you to let me know what's going on, because apparently I'm the last to know here. We're in the same boat. Mr. Wheeler. The defense is requesting that the court sit these matters down for a change of plan Wednesday of next week when uh, lead counsel for the Parkland case can be here. She's currently out of state and she filed a notice of unavailability this week. Uh, but it's our intent to enter a change of plan as to both cases to all charges. Okay, I have no problem setting the lead homicide case on Wednesday for a change of plea as long as the, the state is available on Wednesday. However, I have 109 members of the community that are coming back on Monday morning at 8.30. And, oh, or actually 55 and then 55 at 1. I don't want to bring those individuals back and inconvenience them if, in fact, uh, we don't need to do that. So if Mr. Cruz wants to plea on the attempted aggravated battery case, that needs to be done today. Because as we all know, uh, people change their minds. I'm not going to excuse those jurors until the case is pled, and I don't want to have them come back if that's the intention. So it, that case needs to be pled today, whether it be this morning or this afternoon. The other matter, I don't have a problem waiting for lead counsel. Judge, it, it's up to the court what the court wants to do. Obviously, the court has to accept the, the, the defendant's guilty plea. Um, I, I think that uh, if the court feels that it doesn't want to inconvenience the, the members of the community, I understand it completely. I would ask that it be, you know, rolled on Monday, if the court wants to do that, I would ask that my client be dressed out for court for the change of plea as to any case, either the parking case or the bullshit case. Well, it's only 20 to 11 now. So what if the sheriff's office, if I were to uh, ask them and they would agree to put him, to dress him for in his trial clothes and we can come back at 1 and do it? Because I can't, I, even if it's only 55 people, that's 55 people that have to drive all the way, find parking, pay for parking. I, I, I really don't want to do that um, unless it's necessary. And again, you know, folks often change their mind. Not that your client will or won't. I don't know. But that happens uh, where, where somebody changes their mind, and that's why I don't want to excuse them until I've taken the plea. I find, you know, I accept the plea, and it's all set. We have the paperwork, and I make the requisite findings. Judge, I have the paperwork in hand if that, if that humiliates the court's mind at all. But. but he can, until I go through a colloquy with him, he could change his mind. And again, because we are have already started the trial in that case, I want to do that today. I'm sure that I can arrange to have him dressed. And Judge, just so that we're clear, we're, we're asking that the court to impose a sentence on Wednesday on the counts 18 through 34 in the Parkland case to 17 consecutive life sentences. Well, we don't have to... We, I think that's uh, premature as far as discussing that. I first need to take his plea, and it needs to be on the case that we've started the trial on. And then I'll schedule the plea on the other case. Um, but for today, may I see... We have Captain Carter in the back there, Carter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to call you out, sir. May I, see, may I see you for a moment, sir? Thank you. I don't want to embarrass him.
Okay, thank you, Sheriff's Office. The Sheriff's Office has indicated that they can have him up here dressed in 15 minutes. And then I can give you all time to go over the, the um, stuff with him if you need to, and I can put the white noise on, take a recess, let you do that, and then I'll accept his plea. Judge, the state would raise the issue of, of competency only as far as I've been uh, advised that the defendant has been evaluated for competency and has been found to be competent as recently as this morning. And we want to make sure that part of the plea colloquy addresses that. Well, I always ask people uh, whether or not they are, they've been diagnosed with a physical or mental illness, what it is, whether they're taking medication. That's part of my standard colloquy. Just, Judge, I have no issues as to my, my client's competency at this time. Okay. And it hasn't been raised in this case, but since I know that he was evaluated this morning, I just sure. feel like I, I always go over that. that. That is part of my standard plea. All the lawyers in here know, I'm, I think, Mr. Wheeler, you would be familiar with my plea. Um, and I go over that in depth to make sure that the person can make a knowing, voluntary, and, and uh, intelligent waiver of all of their rights. So. Thank you. Okay, so we'll be in recess for 15 minutes. Uh, the sheriff's office is going to bring him up, and then Mr. Wheeler and Mr. Ehrman, however long you need to speak to him, uh, you can let me know, and then I'll accept the plea. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Happening? Yes, and I'm joining you live from an adjacent courtroom. Let me unpack this for you a little bit. So remember, there are two cases. There is the Parkland shooting death penalty trial case, right? And then there was the battery on a law enforcement officer. It's a second degree felony case. That relates to that 2018 caught on camera BSO jail guard attack. It was uh, on surveillance video and it happened about nine months after the Parkland shooting. If you recall, heading into today, looking ahead, Monday was supposed to be the start of final jury selection for that second degree felony case with trial testimony expected on Tuesday. And then as of this morning, what happened was the defense team for Nicholas Cruz comes in here for the status hearing and essentially is saying to the judge that when it comes to the Parkland shooting case, they are intending to want to plead guilty to all of the charges in that indictment. She stops him right there and says, but first, let's talk about this battery in a law enforcement officer case because we have potential jurors already scheduled to arrive on Monday. So where we just left them is she, re she asked BSO if Nicholas Cruz could get his trial clothes on and get in here so that they can first address that matter. So now joining us is Mark Eiglarsh. He is a criminal defense attorney and former Miami-Dade prosecutor. Before we get to the Parkland, let's just again, so in 15 minutes, we're going to see Nicholas Cruz. They're going to once again address competency, right? We heard a little bit about that to make sure that he is prepared to plead to the battery case. That's correct. The first thing the judge has to do is make sure that his decision to plead guilty is knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily made. If he's not competent, she cannot go forward. But we did hear, apparently there was an evaluation done as recent as this morning, and it looks like it's a green light go. Okay, now let's get to what we anticipate now could be happening on Wednesday of next week. This is years of conversation on this. And so what the defense is essentially saying is they are pleading to the judge. There was so much time where they were trying to work, right, in a plea arrangement with the state saying uh, he'll plead to everything if you take death off the table. Right. The, the state has rejected that. And now we see this change in tactic where they're just going right to the judge, which then would trigger in a death penalty case, correct, what would be the at that point the second phase, the penalty phase. So I'm packing that and explaining why. Why make this decision? Okay. So the public defenders who are representing Cruz are doing this for one reason, one reason only, because they believe it's in Cruz's best interest. They wouldn't do it otherwise. 
They believed then that it increases the chances that he would get life as opposed to death. There's arguments that they could make in the second phase, in the penalty phase. They could say, look, he accepted responsibility for what he did. We didn't put you through a long trial. They also candidly are trying to minimize the amount of gore and, and, and details evidencing the abhorrent nature of this offense, and that works to their benefit. And unlike a sentencing hearing, which maybe you might be more familiar with, when it comes to a death penalty trial, when you get to a penalty phase, this is run like a mini trial. They're going to be talking and presenting evidence. They'll be yes. speaking about the character of Nicholas Cruz. Can you explain a little bit about the kinds of evidence you're going to see? Yes, it's similar to a trial in that there'll be opening statements and the rules of evidence apply. But it's very different in that the sole determination that the 12 jurors will make is whether he should live or die. And I'm doing this with my hands because I'm showing like a scale. The prosecution will give their aggravators, as what it's called, the reasons why he should die, and then the defense will present mitigators, reasons why he should live. And the jurors go back and they weigh that, and they must come up with a unanimous decision. If all 12 say he should die, he dies. If one of them says he should live, and that's their determination, he lives. It must be 12 to 0 in favor of death for him to get the ultimate sanction of death penalty. And so therefore, do you think that maybe one of the reasons underpinning this defense uh, idea here is to mitigate against the amount of harrowing testimony that the same 12 member jury would be exposed to if they went through both phases? Absolutely. There's no question this is a strategic decision. The first ideal scenario didn't work. State, we're willing to plead guilty. Please waive the death penalty. Please, please, please. The state has made it clear they're not going to do it. So the next best thing is let's waive this argument that he's innocent or that he's mentally ill because that's not going to likely work. They know it won't. So let's go right to the penalty phase. And every time the state puts another gory photo in front of them, they could say, look, we've already pled guilty. We're not denying this was an abhorrent offense. We just believe that there's reasons why that you should spare his life. Also then, it's interesting, I wonder if part of this is the defense team, in a way, in the court of public opinion, working to flip the script. Because if they come here on Wednesday and say, look, court judge, pleading guilty to, to everything, life, are they then also sort of telegraphing perhaps state prosecution do you really want to put the community through this and go to a penalty phase yes i'm confident that the defense is not giving up the hope albeit a very slim hope that the state somehow would change their position and just say okay you know what we'll waive the death penalty do you think that's likely very unlikely in fact i think the possibility is so low and remote it approaches almost no real value I'm also curious about your thoughts on, and you all might remember just last week when we were covering what was the initial jury selection process for the upcoming battery on a law enforcement officer case. Cruz and the defense team uh, spent two days hearing panel after panel groups of potential jurors say they could not be fair and impartial. Cruz and the defense team watched some of those jurors cry at the sight of them. Uh, we did see Cruz on that um, one of those days just break down a little bit, distressed, yeah. Yeah. as he bore witness, I think, to the impact on community. How much do you think all of that maybe have weighed in to this decision today? I think it's a great point. I think that that's significant. You know, as trial lawyers, we dream of getting a fair trial. And then the minute you get in here and you hear what the jurors are saying, you go, my goodness, I, I don't know that I'm going to get a fair trial. And so there's so much prejudice here that I think that the defense lawyers feared that, you know, this could be really problematic if we try to argue uh, that he's not guilty by reason of insanity or argue that he's not guilty for some other reason. They knew that that was not going to happen. So let's say we do get to a penalty phase of the death penalty case when it relates to the charges in the indictment for the Parkland shooting. And the defense team already knows that it is going to be a challenge to find a fair and impartial jury. And now you're talking about the highest stakes of that conversation and you need 12 of them instead of six. Correct. What are your thoughts on how many jurors they would have to bring in as a pool to really get to that number and the difficulty of that? Oh, my goodness. A lot. A lot. First of all, as if somebody can't inherently be fair, they're gone for what we call cause. There's going to be tons of people who don't want to be here, COVID, 
They're saturated with the media on this case, and they do not feel that they could be fundamentally fair on a case like this. Then there's many people who don't want to be here and decide whether somebody should live or die. I think that they, whatever number they think that they need, they should triple it. Thank you so much for joining us. Or stay with them. Okay, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Please state your full name for the record. Uh, Nicholas Cruz. Are you currently under the influence of any alcohol or illegal drugs? No, no ma'am. Are you taking any medication? Not at the moment, no. Nope. Okay, when you say not at the moment, do you mean not today or not in the past I, month? I have taken in the past, but nothing recently. Okay, and where, by recently, are you talking a week, two weeks? Uh, about like uh, probably a year. year okay, now. so you haven't, you're not, you haven't taken any medication in a year? Nope. All right. Uh, do you suffer from any physical or mental illness? I was told in the past, uh, but I don't believe I have any issues. Okay, what what did they tell you? You said uh, you were told in the past. I was told in the past that I suffered like anxiety, depression. Okay, and uh, but no formal diagnosis. No formal diagnosis. All right, and how are you feeling today? Feeling all right. I understand you're nervous. I, I assume you're nervous. That's normal. But yep. what I need to know is, are you feeling any type of anxiety to the extent that you would not be able to understand or follow along with me when I'm speaking to you? I uh, know. I understand. Okay. And uh, you're thinking clearly? Yes, ma'am. And you understand me when I'm speaking to you? Yes, ma'am. And are you having any trouble uh, communicating with your lawyers? No, I, I am not. Okay. And do either of the attorneys have any reason to believe that uh, Mr. Cruz's competency is, is compromised this morning? No, Judge. I don't. Okay. Sir, how old are you? I am 23 years old. And how far did you get in school? I got to 11th grade. Do you read and write the English language? Yes, ma'am. Have you gone over the charges and the charging document with your lawyers? Yes, ma'am. And have you gone over the the plea form with your lawyers? Yes, ma'am. And have you read each and every paragraph that's listed in this two-page plea form? Yes. And are, th is, are these your initials here uh, showing? I'm sorry. I you all can, you want to take it? I just want to make sure that you are the person that initialed or perhaps you read it and someone initialed on your behalf. Yeah, these are my uh, signatures. Okay, so you initialed each paragraph as you went over it. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Now, um, sir, also, state, did you give me a score sheet? Thank you. Thank you. And um, has the defense had the opportunity to look at the score sheet? Yes, Judge. All right. So I'm going to go 
over your charges with you now. In count one of the information, you're charged with attempted aggravated battery on a law enforcement officer. That's a second degree felony, and it's punishable by a maximum of 15 years Florida State Prison. Do you understand? Yes. Count two, you're charged with battery on a law enforcement officer. A third degree felony punishable by up to five years Florida State Prison. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Count four, you're charged by information with depriving an officer means of protection. It's a third degree felony and it's punishable by a maximum of five years Florida State Prison. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Count four is attempted use of a self-defense weapon against a law enforcement officer. That's a first degree misdemeanor and it's punishable by up to a year in the county jail. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand each of the charges as well as the maximum uh, possible penalty that can be imposed on each charge? Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay. Sir, under the Florida Criminal Punishment Code, that's your score sheet. With these charges alone, you score 14.40 months Florida State Prison at the bottom of the guidelines. So I have the discretion to sentence you from a period of 14.40 months Florida State Prison up to and including the maximum penalty on each, on each and every charge that I just went over with you. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Okay, it's also my understanding that this is an open plea to the court today. Is that correct, Mr. Wheeler? Yes, ma'am. Which means you are asking, as opposed to negotiating a plea with the state, you are pleading to the court and asking the court to impose what I believe to be a fair and appropriate sentence in this case. Do you understand? I understand. Do you understand that I'm not making you any promises or guarantees as to what sentence I will impose um, at this time? Yes. Okay, has anyone made you any promises or guarantees as to what sentence would be imposed if you were to plead open to the court today on these charges? No, ma'am. Has anyone threatened or coerced you into entering into this plea? No, ma'am. Have you had enough time to speak to your lawyers? And when I say lawyers, um, that could be Mr. Ehrman, that could be um, Mr. Wheeler. You, you have the benefit of having a team of lawyers, so when I say lawyers, I'm speaking individually of them and of them in, in the collective or as a group. Are you satisfied with their services? Yes, I am. Is there anything else that you feel your lawyers need to do on your behalf that they have not already done before you enter into your plea today, sir? No, ma'am. Do you understand, sir, that by entering into a plea today, you are waiving several constitutional rights, including the right to require the state to prove each and every allegation against you beyond and to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt? Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. You're waiving your right to have a trial in this case. Now, as you know, we have uh, begun jury selection in this case, and as soon as the jury was selected, we finished the selection, which I assume would happen Monday, we would start the trial. And at the trial, the state would have to prove, by testimony and evidence, each and every allegation and each and every element of each charge against you beyond a reasonable doubt. And if they could not meet their burden of proof, the jury would have to find you not guilty. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. And do you understand that by entering into a plea, you're waiving your right to require the state to prove these charges? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand you're giving up the right to have your lawyers confront and cross-examine the state's witnesses who are called to <laughs> testify against you? Can we... Is there, a... Is there a way we can mute the... You have to mute it on your system. Mute all... How do I do that? On the Zoom. On the other screen. It's not coming on the screen. It's on the other screen. Okay, she just moved. Okay. Yeah, but I'm still going to. How do I mute everybody? You have to click on the little button. Don't click on them. They all muted. This person's not muted. No, that's. All right, sir, do you understand that you're giving up your right to have your lawyers confront and cross-examine the state's witnesses who are called to testify against you? Yes, ma'am. Just like your lawyers confronted the state's witnesses at the motion to dismiss, they would again have the opportunity to confront in that type of manner uh, all of the witnesses that would be called to testify against you. Do you understand? Yes. Yes, However, but by entering into a plea, you're giving up that right. Do you yes, understand? You're also giving up your right to remain silent and not have that held against you in any way whatsoever. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. If you were to choose not to testify at trial, I would tell the jury that they could not 
hold that against you under any circumstances. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. You're also giving up the right to present testimony and evidence or a defense on your own behalf if you have one. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Finally, sir, you're giving up the right to appeal the judgment and sentence of the court. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. If you were to take these charges to trial and have a trial in this case, and after trial you were to be found guilty, and either your lawyers or yourself or an appellate lawyer were to believe that either myself or one of the attorneys committed reversible error, you would have grounds to appeal the judgment and conviction. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Do you understand by entering into the plea you're, you're giving up that right? Yes. Do you also understand that if, if um, you were to go to trial and you were to be convicted of one or all of the charges or some of the charges, that you would have the right to appeal my ruling on the motion to dismiss, which I, I deny. But by entering into a plea, you're waiving your right to appeal and take that issue to a higher court. Do you understand? I understand. You're giving up your right to appeal any issues that have been decided a pre-trial. So any motions that were heard and not ruled upon in your favor uh, could ultimately be appealed if you were to, to uh, go to trial and you were to be convicted of one or any of the charges, but by entering into a plea, you're giving up that right. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand. Okay, do you have any questions about that? No, ma'am. In addition, sir, I need to advise you that the state is going to be using this conviction in this case as evidence of an aggravating factor for purposes of arguing in favor of the death penalty. Do you understand that? Yes, I do, ma'am. And do you understand that, that you understand the meaning of an aggravating factor? Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And um, has the defense counsel gone over the, the, the concept of aggravating and mitigating factors with the, their client so that they uh, are confident that he does understand uh, what they mean and, and how this uh, judgment here today, a conviction will impact him and his uh, homicide trial. Judge, I've gone over the pros and cons of either trying this case or uh, entering a plea to this case and the impact that would have on the 1958 case. Okay, and you're confident he understands what I say when I'm, when I'm explaining to him about an aggravating factor? Yes, Judge. Okay, thank you. Is <clears throat> excuse me. Um, is the defendant waiving PSI? Yes, Judge. I've explained that to him also. Right. Sir, if you are not a U.S. citizen, you will be subject to deportation under the laws and regulations of the Department of Homeland Security upon entering into this plea. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. In addition, sir, if the offense to which you are pleading is determined to be a sexually violent or sexually motivated offense or if you've been previously convicted of such an offense, this plea may subject you to involuntary commitment upon the completion of your sentence. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Uh, has the state disclosed all items of physical evidence and discovery, Ms. Schneider? Yes, we have, Your Honor. And has the defense reviewed the discovery in this case uh, with your client? I have, Judge. And is either, is either the party aware of any physical evidence, if tested, that may exonerate the defendant of the charge or charges in this case? No, ma'am. State? You're not aware of any evidence that would exonerate him? Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Cruz, at this time, do you have any questions, either for me or for your lawyers? If you need to speak to your lawyers, I'm happy to give you time in private so that you can talk to them. Uh, I'm about to ask you how you wish to plea in this matter, and then um, there won't be any time for questions. So now is the chance. If you have any questions for me or your lawyers, uh, just let me know. I think I'm good. Okay, you sure? Yes, ma'am. All right. Sir, in case number 18-14129, to count one of the information, attempted aggravated battery on a law enforcement officer with a deadly weapon, how do you wish to plea? I plead guilty. Count two, battery on a law enforcement officer, how do you wish to plea? Guilty. Count three, depriving an officer means of uh, protection, how do you wish to plea? Guilty. And count four, attempted use of self-defense weapon against a law enforcement officer. How do you wish to plea, sir? Guilty. Also, are you uh, agreeing that your credit for time served at this point is 1,068 days? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I accept your plea of guilty. I find that you are alert and intelligent, that you understand the nature of the charges, that you understand the consequences of entering into the plea. I find that you have made an informed decision 
with the advice of counsel, and that you're knowingly, voluntarily, and intelligently waiving all of the rights that I just went over. Are the parties stipulating to a factual basis for purposes of the plea in this case? Yes, Judge. Your Honor, the state is prepared to prove by competent evidence that on November 13th of 2018, the defendant attacked Sergeant Ray Beltran, who is in the courtroom today. Um, Sergeant Beltran was wearing full BSO gear and was in fact working at the jail, so the defendant was quite aware that he was a law enforcement officer. The defendant proceeded to kick, hit, punch Sergeant Beltran, attempted to remove Sergeant Beltran's uh, electric taser, uh, took that electric taser and attempted to hit Sergeant Beltran with it over the head as if it was a blunt object and uh, attempted to remove that from this person, thus giving a basis for all of the charges. Okay, based upon the proffer uh, supplied by the state, the... Judge, we would stipulate as the facts as alleged in the PC. Okay, this, the, the stipulation by the defense counsel as well as my own review of the court file and my review of the video that was presented to me at... Uh, a court hearing, I do find there's a factual basis for the plea, and... Your Honor, I'm just going to interrupt for a second, because for some reason the printout that I gave you of the uh, score sheet did not include the last charge, so I've added it. It makes a little point of difference, but I would ask that we use the corrected score sheet. D did you give Mr. Wheeler a copy? Uh, I will in a second. Because we have the point. Sure it's not there? No. It's not seen. It's not seen. Maybe I did it. Do you have a second answer? No. There's a point to, but it wasn't listed, so I've listed it now. So, have you seen the corrected score sheet? Yes, I, I saw it when she handed it to you, Judge. It's fine. Do you want to take a look at it? Okay. But the the ultimate calculation is by it, it looks like he scored what I told him was fourteen point four zero at the bottom and now it's fourteen point four one. Okay. Do you understand, Mr. Cruz? Yeah, I, understand. I advise you that the bottom, what we refer to as the bottom of the guidelines or of the lowest permissible prison sentence under the Florida Criminal Punishment Code was 14.40 months for Florida State Prison. Uh, the state inadvertently uh, left off the use of a self-defense weapon, which is a first-degree misdemeanor. When you add that misdemeanor, which is a point two. You come up with the lowest permissible prison sentence in months of 14.41, okay. as opposed to what I told you, 14.40. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand. Does that change your decision as to whether to enter into this plea today? Nope. Okay. And uh, is Mr. Cruz requesting a PT, uh, PSI? We are not, Judge. So you're waiving PSI? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and when are you all requesting to set the second case for a plea? Wednesday, Judge. That's clear. And does that date suit the does that date suit the state? Yeah, that's fine, Your Honor. So we'll do it Wednesday at nine a.m. That's fine. And how long do both sides anticipate this taking? Are there going to be um, is it going to be anything other than a plea? Are you going to ask me to hear from anyone, Mr. Satz? No, Your Honor, it's going to be a, another phase to it. So. Uh, no, I understand. I understand, but hmm? but I just want to make sure. So it should be an hour at the most. Yes, I mean, we're, we're going to ask the court to sentence him on counts 18 through 34 to 17 consecutive life sentences. So if the state would like to have their victims here to present their, their testimony, they'd have the opportunity to do so. I'm not inclined to sentence him until the end of the trial. When I impose the sentence that's recommended by the jury, uh, I would just sentence him at that time. Well, is there a reason you want him sentenced earlier than that? Because then we have to have testimony and evidence twice. I assume, Mr. Satz, if, if, if I were to sentence him on the non-homicide um, charges that you would want, would you have then, would you then have people that would want to speak 
I'm sure we would. The victims probably would. So it seems to me, it's, it's a, it's. We can do it all at once. Well, Judge, the the sentencing for counts one through seventeen, obviously, is what the penalty phase is going to be for. I understand. Um, realistically, what is the relevance of the the counts eighteen to thirty four? The state's seeking to not not impose death on those on those counts, and they can't. But I, we can cross that bridge on Wednesday, Judge, if you want to do that. Then. All right, but just so you know, my inclination is only to accept this plea on Wednesday. Um, now. For the original purpose that we were here, uh, I asked that we do a status conference for the lawyers on the homicide case so that I could tell you which days I have set aside for pre-selection of jurors. Judge, I would ask the court to entertain pushing that conversation off into Wednesday also. Uh, Ms. McNeil has filed a notice of unavailability for this week, but she will, she will be back on Wednesday. Okay, it was the whole point of this hearing. I. I'm confused why we're here, if that was the reason why I needed to meet with you all. Um, I'm just going to say, this is what I'm going to let you know right now. I, I'm, I have had the clerk's office issue summons for jurors November 8th, 9th, 10th, 15th, 16th, 17th, 29th, 30th, 31st. Judge, can you give me those dates I'm sorry. Time? Yes. November 8th, 9th, and 10th. November 15th. 16th and 17th, November 29th, 30th, and December 1st. Those are all Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, as well as December 6th, 7th, and 8th, and December 13th, 14th, and 15th. I've made arrangements to have extra jurors summoned just for us, and um, those are the dates that I have set aside. That's 15 days. We, I think we can get there 250 a day. We'll use Judge Williams' courtroom. We have it all mapped out so that we can have up to 58 people socially distanced in that courtroom. Um, and we can get through, hopefully, the better part of jury selection so that after the first of the year we can start the trial. That's that's my intention. Judge, I don't... I don't... I don't believe we're going to be ready uh, to begin the jury selection on those dates, Judge. Um, I would like Ms. Neal here as lead counsel for the penalty phase to explain her need for continuance. Okay, well, uh, I'll, have, I'll consider whatever you, you asked me to, but, but that's that's the plan. Mr. Satz, you want to say yeah, something? I just wanted to you know, put on the record again, Your Honor, we haven't received any witness list for either the guilt phase or the penalty phase. Uh, it's going to be mental mitigation. We want an opportunity to know who these people are and take their deposition, and if necessary, have our experts. I understand. I was unequivocal with all the lawyers here, including Ms. McNeil, that this month was going to be set for Mr. Cruz's first trial starting October 4th, and then I set aside the entire week of October 18th and the 25th for all of the pretrial motions in the homicide case, and I was very clear that I intended that the trial was going to start after that. So there shouldn't be any need for any type of continuances. Everyone knew what was happening. Um, and if the, they haven't been listed, then I don't know what to tell you. Maybe they're not calling any. Um, but we're in recess for now, and I'll see you all Monday at 9 a.m. We're going to do it in – no, not Monday. You said Wednesday. Wednesday, Wednesday at 9 a.m. in Judge um, Williams' courtroom, which is – what is it? Seven, 70, 7840. You want us in Judge Williams' courtroom for Wednesday's change of plea? Yes. We already have it all set up. I think there's more room, and it will be um, more comfortable for everyone. Okay? Is, is, is it the court's inclination to uh, adjudicate and sentence Mr. Cruz now on the Beltran case? No. Okay. You want to hold off until Wednesday? I'm going to defer for now. Understood. Thank you. Your Honor, this is Deanna Sherman on behalf of one of the media coalitions. May I just ask an administrative question about this Wednesday's hearing? Okay. Will you, um, there are some 70 of us, Your Honor, on Zoom this morning. Will you be uh, amenable to making a Zoom link available for Wednesday's hearing as well? It's my understanding from the Chief Judge that Court TV was planning to be here uh, next week on Monday for the trial, so I would assume that they would be covering... Wednesday's hearing, live streaming it, and that there would be 
uh, an alternate room available. So if that is the case, I am not inclined to have a Zoom link um, because you all will be able to stream it from, from there um, like you did for the, for the jury selection.